And so here's how the Group B table looks now after two matches played. Portugal and Spain level at the top on four points, identical goal difference too. Iran still very much in it, so it will all hinge on the results in those, those remaining two fixtures. Spain against Morocco and Iran against Portugal. So Group B very much alive. So uh, Spain won't be celebrating just yet, but the, of the two fixtures remaining in, I was just thinking there that Morocco are the team really with nothing left to play for. I know they'll probably give it their best. Yeah. But is it advantage Spain now over Portugal, really? I think it is, uh, Peter. I think nobody's going to be queuing up to play friendlies against Iran. And I think they'll do the same and they'll try to frustrate Ronaldo and co. And uh, Portugal don't have the range of quality around the field that Spain have. So it's like, that's going to be a very interesting match, a very tight match. Um, Spain had to dig very, very deep tonight and they got lucky. The Costa goal was lucky and the offside, uh, which was correctly given. Yeah. I think we've established Richie has done the work there. Um, he went their way. So they know they've been in a hell of a hard match. Uh, and it's interesting to reflect on because they are, I think, if Neymar is out of Brazilian team, they are the favourites, yeah. bookies' favourites anyway. And it, the other thing it puts to bed is the doubt that there'd be this old split between Barcelona and Real Madrid. Those guys were all together tonight, oh, yeah. and that's big. Yeah. And it's also big for Hierro. That's his first crisis he's faced. Yeah, it was and a he's test. Got, he's got out of it. Yeah. It's also good for football overall, isn't it, <clears> Kevin? Because the team whose philosophy it is to attack have won the game. The team who went out to defend yeah. have been beaten. In fairness to Aranda, when they did go behind, they came out and played, and they probably, yeah. you know, created the better chances um, in that second half. You know, they really surprised me. I didn't know if they had that in it. We didn't see it in the first game. Obviously, they scored the winner at the end. But to see that tonight, you know, it made me worry for Portugal in the last game. Iran can sit back and defend all they want. But when they come out and play, they've got some good players. And they really created some dangerous opportunities in the, in the second half. Well, that's a very interesting point. Because I suppose, in a way, we were almost lauding Quiroz at halftime for the, the way they have set up defensively. But uh, possibly, Richie, well, they've been better off if they attacked uh, more frequently right from the off? No, they looked like a decent team going forward, they, didn't they? they? They did. But I think there's a reason. If, if you objectively look at this and look what the players he has and look what he's up against, if, mm. if to suggest that you abandon the defence first policy... Well, not abandon it, but... We'll, we'll tweak it to mean you put less of your emphasis on defence, which means you're going to provide either more space or more opportunity or more time on the ball for Spanish players. These Spanish players given more space, I think, would have done more with it. So I, I think they approached it superbly. I said at halftime, it was yeah. a heroic defensive performance. And we, we wondered then, if Spain got the breakthrough, how would Iran be able to respond? Because they showed Littler now attacking threat at the weekend, or last game. But they did, they did really well. It was like a phenomenal performance by them. They've been one of, the, one of the real big surprise stories so far at this World Cup. And the thing is, as we said, they're still very much in the competition. OK, we're going to look back at the key moments of that game right now. And first of all, the goal aim. And as I said, a little bit of luck involved yep. for Diego Costa. But you have to be in the right place to yeah, get that little bit of luck, and don't also you? Iniesta did well because he got in behind the, the, the blocks of four uh, and he found some space. Um, and he did, he did well. He, he saw Costa. And this is where Costa is good. Even the goal he scored the other night against Portugal. Uh, bodies all around him. He gets, he gets very lucky though, um, but you have to, as you say, you have to be in the right spot to be lucky and he has got the ability uh, to turn and the defender panicked back at the net. Now that is a break, they, they were desperate for a break, they probably deserved it in a way because they'd done all the attacking, but when, when people say luck is needed, luck is needed and this is lucky. And also, I was thinking, Eamon, in the build-up to that goal about Andreas Iniesta, who played such a significant role in it. Yes. You know, that I was thinking, surely he could have done another season with Barcelona playing like that. I mean, somebody in Japan <coughs> is going to benefit greatly from his skills, aren't they? Yeah, he's, that's right. He's gone to Japan and yeah. he'll, he'll make his, he's loved by everybody in Spain. Yeah. Uh, universally loved. All fans love him. Yeah. He scored a winning goal in the 2010 uh, World Cup. And he, he's a complete gentleman and a great credit to the sport. He is. And uh, Kevin, it just goes to show again, it takes...
players of that calibre in what was a really difficult match tactically for Spain. It takes that sort of player to find a way through and he found a way through for Diego Costa. He did. He looked when you're the centre forward you want your attacking midfielder to find you, to look for you, to try that pass. Costa gets very lucky obviously. As he said he's good with his back to goal. He tried to turn. He did the positive thing and he got his bit of luck. It was probably the only um, attempt he had on goal for the night. I can't, mm. I can't remember him you know, being involved in anything else but you know, he's probably second top scorer in the tournament. Now he's three goals and he's off to a flyer. And, you know, a bit of luck, um, you know, is what they did deserve it. Spain deserved that tonight. They were the better, they were the better team. They tried to play football. They, yeah. You know, Iran tried to stifle them for a long time. But, you know, that goal was just deserts. And, um, you know, it's, it's good to see the team who, who tried to play football win. Yeah, there were audible gasps all around the stadium on a couple of occasions, Richie, during that second half. Uh, but particularly when uh, Iran got what we thought initially was an equaliser. But VAR cleared it up and it wasn't. There was a lot of gasps in this studio as well when this <laughs> went in. And there was, it, there was obviously a little bit of a confusion initially. We, we, we saw the, the, the referee's hand go up as the footage there has just shown. These players at this moment don't realise what's going on. Spanish players are there appealing with the referee. To be clear, this is a goal that was disallowed because of the assistant referee's flag. What the referee is doing now is just going to VAR to second, to just to make sure. Um, so this isn't a decision that VAR came in and overruled an incorrect decision. So um, the, the system worked. It was, it was implemented correctly by the referee. The right outcome was reached. So we're not talking here about a goal that was wrongly given. Yeah. Um, so it was well worked by the official there on that occasion. Yeah, the time actually from the referee going to VAR and the decision being made was 1 minute 34 seconds. But yeah. of course... Do you know what a lot of people talk about? The people in the stadium yeah. don't know. We didn't know. We weren't privy. Now, if it's a game of rugby union, the people in the stadium are privy to what's going on. And, of course, uh, people at home. And that's yeah. they need to refine that. In this particular instance, Eamon, I think uh, the VAR... We, we have seen what was happening when the referee went for a, a review in previous games. Yeah. And the, the, the fans in the stadium are supposed to be shown the result, the outcome of the VAR, yeah. after the fact. And we don't know sitting here whether that came up on a big screen in the stadium or not. But there is still an element of confusion well, there, isn't there? Yeah, it took us a long time to get the definitive view of it. But we have it. Uh, if uh, people just hang on, we can show exactly why it was given. Yeah, th this was it here. We were talking about the two players go up, number 20 and number 19. There's a fist actually there from, I think, yeah. um, you could see that Ezo Tolahi, who was the goal scorer, is in an offside position there at that moment. Yeah. So I know the footage was paused at the moment yeah. the free kick was it taken. It wasn't directly yeah. from the free kick as we thought. Yeah, it, it was, there was, was a touch. the next phase of play. Yeah. Yeah. It was the next phase of play and he was clearly a yard offside. So but the bottom I, line is... I know you, you, you made the comment there about the timing of the decision and how long it took. Well, I'm that, just, that I'm is, just, I'm just going to ask the question, is it too long or that, is it... That, that is relevant, but the key thing for me is was the right outcome reached. That's the starting in all of this. And if it was, in any scenario, just think, well, within reason, it doesn't really matter how long, how long it took. Yeah, the right it, outcome was reached. Yeah, because it didn't interfere in any celebrations because immediately when the goal was scored, Iran thought they had their goal, they went off and celebrated. Then everything had to come to a stop until VAR came to its decision. Wouldn't it be nice, though, for something to come up on the screen, number six, handball at number 20, this is the reason yes. we came to that decision. We're all here. We were five minutes wondering, was it the free kick initially? Was he offside when he took the free kick? Was it there? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just something, you know, there's enough referees up in that little box they're up in to someone type it out, put it up on the big screen, say number 20, handball, that's the correct or whatever it is. Just so everyone isn't, no one's sure. We're still we're, we're saying that's the reason. We're still not sure whether the linesman gave it for the initial free kick where it looked like he might have been a touch offside or was it for the handball? Probably was for that. But just clear up a lot of things by a simple simple message. Yeah, I mean, we have the advantage, Jamin, sitting here in studio looking yeah. at replay after replay, trying to decipher exactly yeah. what VAR we're looking at. I suppose the fans are still at a slight disadvantage they in the are, stadium. and in rugby you can hear the, uh, the chat between the third match official and the referee. Is there any reason why I shouldn't give a try? And you'll hear the response. Uh, and so you're, you're part of it. You're well informed, yeah. yeah. Do you think and there's any, any reason why uh, football is, is reluctant to introduce Yeah, that? I think so. I mean, Didi Hamam, who I have great respect for, he thinks it slows the game down, uh, it takes too long, and he says soccer is not like rugby, it's a free-flowing game. I don't agree, because I think Richie's right. The most important thing is we get the right outcomes, that justice is done on the pitch, that people aren't encouraged to cheat and that fans aren't 
going to feel that their team was cheated. So I think getting the right outcome is, is, is the most important thing. And there is a bit more work to be done on it. I don't know what Kevin thinks about it, but I like it. But people I really respect think no. Yeah, it hasn't been perfected yet. There's did, no did, doubt the about that. The question did, did you ask there, is football likely to bring in a scenario where the, you can hear the referee and the, the official? It, it would be great and it would solve the communication issue and it would cover up a lot of the uncertainty. The, the, the difference between culture on a rugby pitch and football pitch, there is a lot of choice language and communications between the footballers and a referee which you just don't get in rugby. So well, they, don't were, to, they don't have to open the microphone for that now. If, if, you, were to put a, if, you, were to, if you were to put a microphone and, and hear you're communications between the referee, you would hear a lot of other things. that rugby players uh, don't, swear. don't curse more than... <laughs> Or, or the the soccer players there curse tends more to be a, 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 there is, a yeah, sign of respect. There's a no go zone. There's a no, yeah. yeah. And I think if you put a if you put a referee if you put a microphone up against the referees, I think the surround sound that you would hear from the players who are you know in conversation well, or deliberations or appealing, I think would would, would might be too would much. Turn the airways blue. Yeah, it would have you, to be delayed. Well, you've yeah. you Sorry, could, go ahead, yeah, you could just well, you, they could put a little you know big sign on the screen. The game could play on. The decisions made and. A, Two minutes, or thirty seconds later, you know, text could come up on the big screen. This is the decision why it was made, or whatever. It doesn't have to be yeah. live at the time. The just other so thing it up. we need to cut out is uh, players harassing referees. Yeah, but, oh. and I mean, I remember the notorious incident where Roy Keane and a few Manchester United players ran a referee fifty yards, and he was running away from them. And that's got to stop. And I wonder how the introduction of VAR is going to do that because the, the the biggest reason you tell people not to harass the referee is what? Because he's made his decision and he's not going to change it. Now yeah. the introduction of VAR. Mm. introduces the possibility for the first time ever that a referee actually will make his will change his decision. So well, I, I, I think the introduction of this yeah. we inadvertently were, encourages yes. players to But the thing is it is the in the rules already that the, the players are not supposed yeah. to harass the referee to go to VAR and uh, we've seen it. They're we've seen doing. players giving it all this doing. during the tournament and they're actually not supposed to yeah. do it. So I suppose maybe they feel this system is still in a way on a trial basis and that all the rules aren't being implemented rigorously. Kevin, what was your experience of it in the States? Yeah, we had a number of meetings with the rest. It was brought in um, about a year ago in, in, in the MLS. And, you know, a number of meetings, a number of warnings. We can't do that. We can't speak to the ref while it's going on. Your captain is allowed to go up and say one or yes. two words to him, but that's it. Anyone else go up, it's an instant yellow. And they did. It was an instant yellow. Anyone did that sign, instant yellow. So no one did it. You know, straight away it was cut down and that was the end of it, we left them alone, but it doesn't look like they've got the same chat that, that we had. No, and I suppose, uh, Eamon, I think you made the point the other night that uh, a lot of the referees haven't used it in their own leagues, no, they haven't. so this is their first experience of it yeah, on, that's on the world stage. Absolutely, it's massive. I mean, most of the officials involved in all of this now, in front of the whole world, have not got it in their own country. This is really at the experimental stage mm -hmm. uh, and it will be refined, I hope, because yeah. I, I agree with the system. But it is, uh, I think, another curse is this harassment of referees uh, and it should be stopped. The referees' authority shouldn't be in any way threatened and it is diminished by that. Yeah. And they, in rugby, if you do that, you get a yellow card and yeah. you're gone. Yeah. And it's having the political will in FIFA and UEFA, in the Premier League, to actually say, we're sick of this. The fans are sick of this. The referees are sick of it. Because down through the game in schoolboy football, in junior football, yeah. referees are getting uh, harassed or worse. Mm. So we, football as a sport has to clean its act up and make it a game of real sportsmanship played by people who respect the authority figure on the pitch, which is the referee and, of course, the assistant. Yeah. Uh, why do you think, lads, that uh, football has been so lenient? Because we see it. I mean, there are so many cameras now, particularly on the big Premier League games and all the other games we see coming in from La Liga <coughs> and the Bundesliga and Ligue 1 and all that sort of thing. And we see this constant harassing of referees. I'm sure it'd be quite simple to cut it out, wouldn't it? Again, like, the, the phrase, if, there's a, if there's a will within FIFA are the, are the people who introduce real changes or who influence the referees to enforce certain laws. If there's a will there, they can, they can pretty much do anything. Because yeah. like, once you introduce a system where people are going to get booked and consistently booked, so they know a certain action will, reduce and will result in a booking, it'll be stamped out. There is, I mean, the laws are there. It's like foul and abusive language yeah. to an official. The, but the, the line moves a lot in, yeah. in terms of what's actually foul and abusive and is, yeah. is it you know, just swear words you have to swear at him you have to call him something or can you just swear in his general direction or about the situation so 
managers do it, coaches do it, players do it. At the moment, a lot of people think a referee is a, is a justifiable, legitimate target yeah. for abuse when you're just not happy it's with what's going on. It's that works um, yeah. over a period of time. A 90-minute game, you know, if you can get in the referee's head, and referees are human, mm. then you get a result, don't you, very often. I, I, that's the objective of it, isn't yeah. it? The next time he's got to make a decision, he thinks... Yeah, you just you put know, a step told, down, told, intimidate you know, you're him, not rattle him a little bit. Yeah, yeah but some, some people have made the point that <clears> if, <throat> if you sanitise the game to such an extent that it will take a little bit of the, that competitive edge out of, the, out of the game, but also it'll take the edginess that you get from football crowds who are also getting on to the referee, who are also getting on to the opposition, and that it creates this... Atmosphere, okay, maybe an atmosphere of intimidation. Yeah, no, well, I don't, I don't think, I don't think removing I, no. abuse of officials by players could be called sanitising it in, in, no. in like an, in a England negative way, a detrimental worst. way. It would be a huge step forward. Yeah. Like, what does it bring to the game? The occasion, the spectacle, the the atmosphere, like nothing positive at all. No. To see an official, be it the assistant, the fourth official, or the the main referee, just surrounded by players, with hand gestures, mountain chasing them, like. There, there's nothing positive. There's no argument can be made in any way that that adds anything. I'm not agreeing with that. No, I'm just no, the point. I'm just saying, you mentioned uh, the Bundesliga and La Liga. Mm. It's much less prevalent yeah. in those leagues than it is in mm. the Premier League. Why is that? I think the culture around... You know, you, you hear stuff in English football stadiums that you wouldn't want your children hearing. You don't want to hear them yourself. Uh, some of them are very unpleasant. Uh, I think it's... Uh, also, the culture. I mean, for example, uh, in Spain, you see, you now see managers fighting on the touchline. Mourinho introduced that to Spain when he was up against Guardiola uh, and Titi Villanova, the late Titi Villanova, who was the coach, he stuck his finger in Villanova's eye. He introduced that stuff to Spain. Yeah. But most of the uh, European continental coaches are very, very uh, respectful of their. Uh, you know, fellow yeah, coaches, yeah. and they give them a hug after the game, and it's all, it's it's <laughs> what they do. You see them. I mean, I, well, I, I give you some examples if you like. <coughs> Excuse me. Ancelotti, for example, gentlemen through and through. Ranieri, people like that. Um, there is some kind of. There are exceptions to every rule. Um, I think Alex Ferguson, who has, who was a great m coach, uh, he in particular, was aggressive and bad-mannered on the touchline. That's and where we got the Fergie time expression from, isn't it? Yes, and it, but that was also designed to intimidate yeah, yeah. officials, match yeah. officials, and he was, became a cult hero for doing it. And that's, what, that's the difference. I don't think there is an Italian, like Conte at Chelsea, Antonio Conte, he's a total gentleman. Yeah. I haven't seen him fight with anybody. Was it English football that changed Jose Mourinho's approach, Eamon, or...? I think he's a special case. He's not a special one. <laughs> he's a special case. I think uh, Richie does a bit of psychotherapy, he might tell you. But I think he's an insecure guy uh, and uh, a bad example. A bad example for the game. He should be, in now at his stage in life, a, a respected and admired figure for what he's won. In fact, I think a lot of people hold him uh, in contempt. John Giles and people that are really I respect again. Uh, detest him. And yeah, I, I was in a room the other night full of people, who, a lot of Manchester United fans, and we asked the question, who here in this audience would like Mourinho to stay? And no hand went up. And Bobby Charlton spoke out publicly when there was talk of him going to Manchester United uh, when Ferguson was still coach. Yeah. And he said, I don't think he's for us. Uh, Richie, do you think uh, Jose Mourinho's demeanour changed when he returned <clears throat> to the Premier League for his second stint with Chelsea? That there was something different about him Hang on, and his we, approach. Can we, go back, can we go back to the match tonight? <laughs> no, 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 we're talking about Jose Jesus Mourinho. Christ, well, we, it's, how, <laughs> Jose's spirit was there. Go back, can we go back to the general point of, of, of treatment of officials? And, and I think one of us made the point tonight, it's a cultural thing. There are certain things you can aim at senior players or international or top players and say, you know, they're the ones guilty of it and setting the wrong example. Mm. But if you go down to... I remember I had an experience working with Millwall Academy and we won a particular team. We had to send a letter to all the parents of this team. I think there was the under-14 team. said, unless you change your behaviour, we can't stage games because referees were refusing to officiate for your games because the mouthing and the carry-on on the sidelines, which you think is normal and acceptable, is way beyond the line of what's 
what you should be carrying on. So it, it, it's right throughout the game. Go to any football match this weekend and unless the club or a manager of the team has a very strict policy and real clear communications and guidelines with all the parents, you'll see a load of mountain aimed at the referee and everyone will think, you know, that it, 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 you know, whether you're relieving stress, you're trying to intimidate him, that he's a legitimate target for abuse. And okay. that's right throughout the game. Well, that conversation all began with the intimidation of the referees, but I think we can conclude that if that was cut out of the game, it certainly would be a good thing. How did Jose Mourinho get in there? <laughs> Even when he's not involved in the World Cup, he's around somewhere. Anyway, never mind. It's been a very interesting evening in Kazan. It was hard work for Spain, but they eventually came out on top. But even after they scored that goal, uh, Kevin... There were a few moments where Spanish fans would have had their hearts in their, in their mouths because uh, Iran came close on a couple of occasions to equalising. Yeah, they, they came close to taking the lead. This is before... Uh, yeah. And this long throw is before Spain scored. I suddenly turned into an Iran fan, I realised, here <laughs> when they said this net and I was nearly hitting the ceiling. I was jumping up and celebrating. But, you know, it was a great strike. It was um, Amiri with the long throw and Sarif had with the shot. Um, you know, they came out of their shell in the second half and they had to because they were one nil down. But they were winning ball high up the pitch. Coming wide with it, I think this one ends up with an, uh, a Tarine header. It goes wide and a ball across. But they're high up the pitch. They've got numbers in the box, which we talked about Saudi Arabia earlier. Didn't do that. Iran committed people forward. And, you know, it was a weak header in the end. But still, there's four people in the box there. When you have those numbers in there, anything can happen. Um, this one is just good play. Winning the ball higher up the pitch. It ends up coming wide to, to Safri, who puts in you know, a good first-time ball. And again, two people attacking it is nearly getting on the end of it in the end. But again, people in the box, good balls in, anything can happen. Um, this didn't happen in the first half. You know, it was all, all change once they went one goal down and they, and they showed what they could do. He was the, the guy for Iran who impressed me the, the most. Um, you know, Amiri, a nice nutmeg on PK here. And, and a great ball as well. You know, it was the Tamir Tarimi with the header who, who couldn't get over it. But it was very dangerous. Um, Spain were living on the edge. Unlike Uruguay earlier, who, who were never bothered by Saudi Arabia, Spain were bothered by Iran tonight. And Iran in the second half, you know, I, I think they had the better chances and, and you know, would have nearly deserved to, to get something like that game. Yeah, and it all suggests that they certainly could pose a problem for Portugal in, sure. their, in their final game. Uh, I mean, let's have a look at uh, what Spain produced uh, in that second half, having slightly altered their approach. Yeah, I think they, they they always play good football, but the game changes. That was PK didn't PK uh, was not made there as Kevin just showed you, and he also gave the foul away for Ronaldo's goal on Friday night. This is Isco, uh, who's a good dribbler, but the final ball is poor. Uh, and there's the shot. I think it's from Busquets, um, and a very good save by the goalkeeper. But Kevin is right to say that even before Spain scored. Uh, Iran uh, had a chance and uh, the Iran-Portugal game now is going to be really interesting. Absolutely massive. Yeah. Uh, it'll be an exciting conclusion to this group, Richie, won't it? be really good. I mean, the, the three of them can still qualify mm. um, and, and I wouldn't fancy being in Portugal's shoes um, having to go into that game against Iran given what they can do. Defensively, they're very strong. We saw that the first night, we saw that tonight. Um, but they can attack as well. Kevin, do you still think that uh, Spain can be regarded now among the favourites, the, the way that the yeah. tournament is turning out? <clears throat> well, just get out of the group first. They're playing Morocco. Morocco, um, you know, they're out of it now. It's the Iran Portugal game is the, the important one in this group. But you know, Spain haven't been scintillating, but they've done enough. Um, you know, tonight, again, they weren't, they weren't brilliant. They ran were better than we thought, or were Spain not as, as good as we thought? Um, you know, it's, it, it's, there's no top team who's shunned. You know, we go through them all, you can go yeah, through the whole yeah. thing. No one has really stood out yet. Um, I know it's early, it's the group stages, they're all just getting a feel for the tournament. But again, Spain tonight, nervy, not, not on top of their game, but they managed to get the three points, which a lot of the top teams have managed to get the three points without playing that well. And, and they, can only, they can only improve from here. Yeah.